Okay, I think that's working. All right, how are you guys? Did you have a nice fall break? Ah! All right. Um, so we have a little hodgepodgeness of today. Um, going to talk about some general study tips for in here. We should have talked about earlier, but you know, I like to never. Um, paper two is on the horizon. Oh, um, uh, cover a little bit of system system theory concepts, review city design. Um, talk a little bit about. Um, how lots of agriculture is done now, kind of set us up for uh, politics. And if you're good, I'll show a little clip from the Matrix. Any of you have seen that? Oh, you're going to be richer for it. Okay, so um, this is one of those things I um, should probably do more of to kind of give you some tips on how to process information, but the Main point I'd like you to think about is like typically the material in here is a little bit more challenging because it's a little more abstract or it's a little more, the readings are a little denser. So what I hope you're doing is encountering one thing and playing it off against another thing to kind of get some perspective on that. So I was talking to one student who's doing well and her strategy was something like, Examine the reading questions, kind of look those over, then do the reading, think about that. Um, in weeks when there's a lecture that's, or parts of the week when there's a lecture available before the reading questions are due, you can watch that and then come back and answer the reading questions. But in general, and this works well in a lot of classes, um, you kind of have to scale up. So, like when you first do the reading, it may not make complete sense, but if you kind of look at the reading questions ahead of time, that might set you up better. And you could try to do the reading questions as you're reading for the first time, but if there's a lecture on the same stuff, you might want to check that out and then come back to reading. The other thing to think about is after class, some things may make more sense than they did initially. So you might want to go back to some of the stuff that you had read for that class to kind of lock it in. Um, but in general, you know, one way of thinking about it is it's this iterative kind of process. I'll give you a good analogy. How many of you have changed a car tire? You know, okay, excellent. So what's one of the, there's like five lug nuts, right? That's on the car four. Can you just tighten one down first? What are you supposed to do? You're asking if you have one. Pay attention. Just yeah, exactly. So if there's four, you want to like do one here, then here, then here, then here, then back to the first one. Kind of thing. But you're trying to get the whole thing to sink on solid. You don't want to just fork one down and then start it up. So similarly with this kind of stuff, sometimes, at least I found like when I was in college, like I would read the material, I don't understand it, I've done a class, I understand a little bit better, then I have to kind of go back to the material. Um, but that's the ultimate way you're going to make a lot more sense with this stuff, is kind of trying to integrate it together as opposed to approaching it in a linear kind of fashion. So um, that's the quick spiel, um, but I would love to see everybody do well the next test. So if you feel like you still don't have an effective means of getting the stuff here, uh, please let me know and I would love to help with that. In general, the, my experience with students in the past, I ask them, okay, I say, I, but the sense I have from them is they do the reading, they get some of it, then after class, they feel like they got most of it. So it, I don't know if that's your pattern, but um, it is a little different in that I think, um, you might have to hit it multiple times in multiple ways to fully crack that down. Now, on the upside, this might sound like craziness, but I think you might, in doing that, you get better 
it's your reading comprehension and your ability to master difficult material. I find I'm still getting better at reading. I've been at it a long time. Uh, okay. Um, so that's a, just a little trying to help you out there. Plus, I got a cool graphic, huh? Is that my killer? Okay, paper number two, back by popular demand. Um, so we're going to talk about this just a little bit. Um, like the first paper, actually, even even more so the first paper, I'm not really asking you to go do a research project. I want you to take some concepts we've dealt with in here and pull them together and articulate them in a paper, which I think will help you get ready for the final two. Um, okay, so like before, there's an assignment sheet that I'll go over with you briefly here. There's a template, which I would love for you to use. So you include the headers so I can see what's going on. And like before, there'll be a prep step one, prep step two will be a graph, and then you can turn to the actual paper. Okay, so we have been kind of at various points flirting with this notion of systems theory. And in this paper, I'm going to have you uh, articulate it in a little more detail. So I'm going to have you contrast systems thinking with reductive thinking and um, have an opening paragraph where you lay out some of those differences. And then you're going to um, examine that kind of distinction in three domains, um, in natural ecosystems, and then you can choose between city design, agricultural, and swim dancing, and do at least uh, two of those. So to just give you a little flavor of this, um, Duwani talked about um, some of the advantages of mixed use design. So what's mixed use design? You have all the residences in one place and all the business in another place, or what do you do? Yeah, so you, you standardize some things like the form of the building, but in terms of what goes on in there, you abandon some of those earlier principles, like you have to have a residential area, you have an office farm, and you have over here something else. And in the same area, you might have, for example, residence over shop, right? The residence and retail right next to each other. Are there some benefits you get when you mix uses together? What's one or two things that you talk? We'll talk more about this in a second. But what's one or two details that he highlights where you get benefits from that? Can you use uh, fewer resources and less energy to do things? So if you take some, you know, just if you have a corner grocery store, you might be able to get some of your needs met without getting in a car. If you have retail right next to residences, some of the businesses, some of the draw of businesses you need to stay open can come from the people that live right nearby. And those people that live right nearby may be able to go to that retail without having to car. Or you may be able to live near where you work. Now, it won't fix everything, it will still be hard, but you might get some benefits to cut down on some traffic. What about crime? Do you remember what you said about that? What's the key to preventing crime? Yeah, people watching, but even just the illusion that people are watching. So the idea is like eyes on the street, right? So there's an area I live next to all these have these break in. And it was primarily because just it was kind of like there were smaller townhomes, and most people that owned them worked during the day, right? So they would go to work during the day, criminals would come in, they would just take what they want, you could cook, right? But if you have retail uh, and residents above it, what's going on in terms of who's there? What time of day is retail? And the Eight, something like that. And then is there somebody there after we fill them? Yeah, that makes sense. So there's ways of mixing that use that you get. Here's a system theory term 
to get synergy. What synergy? Two plus two equal what? Five, six. The sky's the limit, but the individual parts add up to a whole that's greater than just some of those parts. Okay. Um, so once you before next time, make sure you read this through and start thinking about it. Um, I'm gonna just do a quick spiel here on some systems theory concepts in terms of a little lecture and to get you a head start. <laughs> okay, so one of the things in systems theory is you're trying to see holes in some of the interdependencies rather than just the parts. So when you're looking at an ecosystem, what were the different, what were some of the different roles we looked at in an ecosystem? Remember? Who are the guys that take the sun and convert that to energy? The producers. The producers, right? The primary producers are like plants. Then you have like primary consumers, the little insects and these plants. <laughs> And then secondary consumers, and we go up to apex predator. And then that's when the cool stuff starts. So the apex predator, they just get to live off of everything else and not contribute anything. What did is, what is apex predators contribute? When they die, what happens? They decompose and they become earthworms and other critters are moving through that dirt and creating. Soil, then what is the soil in it? That provides space where the plants can grow. Plants are growing, those are the primary producers, and that gives food to the insects. And does that make sense? So it's just a big circle of life kind of stuff. So in ecosystems, like, and if you think about um, what creates soil, I'm sorry. Part of it, nitrogen in there, nitrogen cycle. There's some ways in which, remember, we just touched on this briefly, but soil in some sense creates itself, right? Like it has different organisms in there that break down different kinds of things. And soil is this area in which all these cycles are going on and maintaining and supporting different kinds of life. So we want to think about that in terms of other things we look at. Going back to our idea of mimicking. So you see some ways in which when Duwani looks at a city, he kind of sees it as a system. So if you take sprawl as a kind of counterexample, and you say, you know what? I'd like to live by myself, kind of on the edge of the city. So what do you do? Move to the edge of the city, right? And what other people do? I think that's a great idea. We're going to do that too. So they moved to the edge of the city, but now the edge of the city is a little bit past you. And then somebody else, that makes sense? So when you take that productive way of thinking, this is what I want, maybe we'll get it, about a larger sense of what's going on, you get these unintended consequences. Right? So, a simplistic example of that Chinese finger trap, right? Put your fingers in. Both people want to get out, what do they do? They pull, and you create the system where nobody's out. So Duani's trying to get you to think about the city in a way where you get beyond that reductive thinking. So how would Duani critique this idea? Somebody saying, hey, there's too much congestion, too much traffic, we need more roads. What's Duani say about that? What is it? What's it? Is a phrase something that demand induced demand? Remember that? So he's saying when you plan those roads, people aren't stupid. Developers will look back and go, okay, so I can put my new tower right here, I can put this right there, whatever. And so as soon as that special road opens, it's already congested because people have anticipated that. So 
He's saying that's not a fundamental solution. What's the fundamental solution? Build the city in a way where people don't have to use privacy. Okay. So, and then we're starting to talk about agriculture again, but are there ways in which the kind of stuff Solution does on this farm? Are there ways in which you see some systems principles there? What are some ways in which, what does he do with the waste from his animals? Waste. So instead of it just being waste, he's like, this is good stuff. So he does the pigerators with good pigerating. He has some cow food, has some wood chips, makes some little corn, makes it like, I like corn. And they burrow in and mix it up, right? But then, then it's no longer waste, right? Because he's made a, a circle where the, the output has become an input for something else. Okay, so we'll we'll keep talking about this stuff. And I think it will make more sense as we go, but it turns the reductive stuff. Is there some drawback to efficiency and negative freedom? So I think Salafan and other people would say yes. Like you can have a hog farm that has just thousands of hogs and nothing else, but what are the problems? That many hogs, you get a lot of what? That's a lot of food, people, right? What are you going to do with all that? So you get these scales that are really efficient. But they have these problems they generate. So there's a way in which, like when people are thinking about climate change, they're like, oh, we could fix that, but it's too expensive. That's maybe a little short sighted, right? If they think a long term view, they could see how you could create some jobs that would help some people. You could create some areas that are better places to live. Um, but there's all kinds of ways in which. You can fall into these traps where you're thinking about the short term and you're not thinking about the long term, or the big picture. So one way of talking about this, so that this is borrowed from um, economics, but you have systems have externalities. So when you're raising hogs on a farm, you have all this poop that you're generating. What are you going to do with it? Mm -hmm. uh, it's not really reflected in the price, the fact that you might be causing neurological problems for your neighbor or polluting the water supply, this kind of stuff. So there's these side effects, these unintended consequences. Um, there's also positive externalities. So if you live like Luana was talking about if you live somewhere where you can be within five minute walk of something, what's going to happen? You may use your car less, and what are you going to do more of? I'm sorry? Yeah, you might walk more. So, remember, I showed you there's some research where in cities that are denser, people walk more and they tend to be less obese. So, that's an example of like positive side effects. So, Duwani, you, you look at something like, uh, okay, there's a, all these people spread out in these homes that are separated. There's not eyes on the street. So, if you're reductively thinking, you might be like, you know what? We got some crime. We need some more police. That'll be so, you, you, you go and you add something else to the system to fix it. Whereas Duwani might say, what if we redesign that system? So there's some symbiotic relationships. So you don't have this externality of crime because you have enough eyes on the street that the problem kind of takes care of itself. So real quick example of externality is just think about like pollution, right? So with global warming, anytime you're burning fossil fuel, you're adding to the global warming problem and the cost of gasoline, does it reflect that? No, but gas, if you come for that, gas should cost four or five times what it does now. And you might say, my God, we couldn't afford to drive. 
Yes, that's probably true. You would need to have cranes or other ways that were more efficient for cars. So that's the concept of externalities. And we talked a little bit about the mixed use already. But in nature, nature is all about cycles, right? You have the water cycle, the nitrogen cycle. Um, people that were that are children eventually become parents and they have children and all these feedback loops. But um, key thing from a public policy standpoint is you're looking for mutual benefit looking for how can you set up systems that have synergy where things work together as opposed to things are going in different directions. Okay, and then last point along these lines, um, just to go back to the West Jackson's idea of mimicking nature. So he said, you know, you can try to control things or you can try to mimic nature. And his suggestion is we probably don't know enough to control it. So you get people trying to work with nature. So what does Solomon say about nature? Nature is what? Smart as nature is as smart as hell, he says. So you have you gotta figure that out. And nature might figure out things that you haven't. And so he looks at these animals and whatever, and tries to find ways of mimicking nature so that they can work better together. So quick side note, can you heard of this stuff? There's this beetle that's crazy strong. You heard about that? What's it, what's it called? It's something like this. D something. What do you say? Dumb? Not dumb. I mean, probably not really smart. No. Oh, dumb. Dumb. I do. Uh, I don't think so. I forget what it's called. But anyway, it was on the show recently. But this beetle, like you can drive a car over it, and it's like, doesn't face it. So they're looking at the way it's constructed and the way inner things are interlocking and whatnot. And they think there could be some defense and other applications of that. So, in other words, nature has figured a lot of things out, if I make sense to think about it. So, what does nature do with waste? Does it just put it in a, you know, there's poop, you're like put that in the bag, put it in the landfill. Mm. It, it recycles it, right? Nature doesn't leave anything that has any energy in it alone. It somehow finds a way to recycle it. Um, so same thing like with traffic, it's a little different, but you might try to solve the problem of traffic by adding more roads or all this kind of stuff. Duane wants to like redesign stuff so you don't have all that. So you might be mimicking nature in terms of bringing different stuff together so that it interacts in a way where it's mutually beneficial as opposed to being everything else. Okay, so some highlights on um, Duane and city design. So I don't think he actually comes out and says this, but um, if you had to take, if, if there's a criticism of suburbia, it probably got that way because everything was designed around what? You create a system where it's designed around a lot of land and cars, right? And that causes pollution and traffic accidents and all this other stuff. So Duane wants to have an alternative and his, what's, what's the core of his philosophy in terms of the redesign? He had to pick one of his principles that was one of the more important ones. Yeah, Duane. So five minute walk, right? Mm -hmm. So five minute walk is one of his principles. And I think if you dig into that, He's saying, what if we design the city around pedestrians versus drivers? And you're like, mm. what? So I think one of his, he didn't come out and say it, but I think one of his design principles is let's think in terms of pedestrians and making life good for pedestrians 
and then go from there. So what are some things he wants to do to make life good for pedestrians? Talk about five minute walk, towards the zones. Some kind of um, central location to a neighborhood to have some sense of this is our neighborhood. What else? Yeah, so what the reductive logic is, we want to make our as fast as possible, right? Let's get 19 months. And he's like, the more lanes you have, what happens? Cars drive faster, and there's more traffic to cross. So when you're favoring the car, you're disfavoring the pedestrian, right? So he's like, no. It almost feels like it's just one like, uh, I wasn't like one of channels, like no grass up here. No little grass, not more lane, less lane. Crazy. Yeah. But if you make streets narrower, what, what naturally happens? People are slower, so you have more walkable, and you make the street more versatile, right? So on a narrow street, you have different kinds of buildings, shops, uh, residences, whatever, and there can be some interaction. You have some wide, highway stretch, it's really hard to do much with that other than just have some business. Okay. Let me pull that up just for a quick second so I can talk through a few slides while I miss. So th these two diagrams are worth studying because there's a lot of information in there. But um, so you have just one main artery road. You might have a, a main boulevard. But what do you have inside? You have a system of streets at right angles, right? So there's a grid. It may not be perfectly right angles. You can have little roundabouts, but. If you want to get from one point to another point, can you get there without having to go on the main road? Yes. So I don't know if you've noticed this, but anywhere where you have this traffic, it's just like if there's an accident, you just go to other routes. What happens when there's an accident on the interstate? It's a nightmare, right? I watch it oftentimes. I have a cross commute, of course, the other way. So one accident will back up traffic forever because there's really no great alternative. Okay, um, so do you have, can you locate businesses somewhere other than the main road? Yeah, because you're pushing some traffic off the main road, you can have some people along this route, some businesses there. Um, can you have kids walking to school? Yeah, because you have some routes that aren't on the, the main road. Um, do you, you have something where you have, so like in this diagram, what are, what's like the, a building that's given a prominent place? The school, right? So the school kind of imagine like sitting up on a hill here and have this boulevard kind of coming up to it. Uh, also, and this is probably where it's a little more neo-traditional. This probably is kind of the center, right? That's a mall or something. But it's a mall that you have roads going through. So it still can be integrated into the, the neighborhood. Um, do you have, where's the mixed use going on? 
So you may not have, like in this diagram, it's kind of hard to show, but these are primarily houses, right? And that's primarily retail or something, but they're at least close enough to people walk, right? So you're gonna get some traffic to these stores from these folks that don't have to get in cars. You've got some kids walking to school, so they don't have to get in cars. And if you have a grocery store or something in here, there's a lot of daily needs that can be by going there, right? All right, let me just hit quick. Um, so this is a little smaller scale. What do you what do you get into when you get to transit oriented development? What's the idea there? So this is more like a regional plan, right? But you have Alex um, it's basically urban centers that like concentrated urban centers that are connected by a train or something like that. Yeah. So people, like one of the advantages of this is you want to live in a city that's just not gargantuan, right? Maybe you want to live somewhere where it has a little bit of sense of place or whatever. This kind of can give you the benefits of both, right? So you have a city or at least, you know, a, a small town or whatever, and it might have some boundaries around it. So there could be parks and stuff, but it's connected by a light rail to another population center. But if you think about collecting these dense urban hubs, what happens to all this traffic here if it needs to go over here? It doesn't, doesn't have to get in the car, right? It can go to the trunk and use either flight rail or what's the other one we looked at a little video on? Not trains. Subways are good too, trains underground. I'm thinking bikes can be part of it. I'm thinking uh, bus, rap bus rapid transit is another system. It's not quite as sexy as a train, but buses can use roads that are already there. So remember Trans Millennial in Columbia? In Columbia, the country? Um, uh, Colum no, Columbia and Venezuela, right? Really? But you can have um, a trunk there that takes up a lot of the, the traffic. So when you look at, um, when you talk to environmentalists, this is kind of like gets them excited, the trains are in development. And some of these, some of Duwani stuff in terms of how you structure a neighborhood or whatever, that can be important too. But um, the environmentalists, it's the transit oriented development. Okay, and then, so what's the suggestion here with um, the contrast between the two neighborhoods? What's one thing you notice over here? Different. Starts with C, it rhymes with non activity. Connectivity, right? So, in other words, there's multiple routes you can go places. Um, is the school in a place of prominence? It is. What's, what's nice about it, too? If you're a parent, did you want your school maybe right here in the hustle and bustle of the, right? So maybe pull the school back a little bit, the other end of the neighborhood, so it's a little or move, but it's still, can kids walk to school? Yeah. And then you can have a kind of park in the center, right? Is there any kind of center in this neighborhood? We know center. Um, you can still have a commercial center, but the advantage relative to here is if you live here and want to go to your commercial center, what do you got to do? So you're still generating a lot of trips, right? Whereas here, the commercial center, these folks can mostly walk to it or bike, whatever, crawl. Okay, so this should make sense. Like it's incorporating some of Duwani stuff, but it's also integrating it, putting it on transit. Okay, I'm gonna leave that there. I just wanna hit a few things. Any questions on the Duwani stuff, sprawl stuff? Take that as a no. All right. Okay. Um, we talked about we had Wes Jackson talking about monoculture versus polyculture agriculture. You have you read Soliton talking about his stuff. 
um, I think it's good to give us a context about what industrial ag agriculture looks like. So some modern practices, we've read about the monoculture idea. We have just like a big farm of corn or soybeans. This is what my family did. Um, the downside of that is you're pretty heavily dependent upon artificial fertilizer and some other stuff that um, Wes Jackson was concerned about. And ironically, like, where does a lot of that corn and soybean go? It's not even really used as food for humans. It just goes and becomes uh, feed for cows. And we'll talk later about the impact of cattle on global warming. Um, and then there's these things called cathodes. Kind of sounds like a new hip restaurant, but it's uh, confined animal feeding operations. So hog farms. Um, are these kind of things where these pigs aren't just these aren't these pigs are a climb out they didn't just behave but they're in these cages and they from birth to death they're in these things so they can't even turn around to the place um, and also this is an aerial shot kind of hard to see but you have the problem of waste if it's not properly stored and disposed of it um, seep in the water supplies cause neurological conditions for humans downwind, et cetera. But the whole confined animal feeding operation is kind of the antithesis of, I think back in the day, we had a family farm that had some livestock and crops and whatever, and I had to make some things. Now it's like you have a sweet hog farm, or it's a cattle operation, one or the other. Okay, matrix. Um, how many of you, have seen the movie The Matrix. This is this is ancient television now, or ancient movies. But um, can somebody explain the red pill and the green pill? Is it red? No, red and blue. I can't remember. Okay, I'll try. So it's this idea that you're, the reality you're living in isn't real, and if you want to see it as it really is, you've got to take the red pill. But if you want to just go back to your happy slumber, you could take the blue pill. So this was the spin off on that. Turn down all the way. Let me try it on here. So I don't want to put all of your eardrums. This is like this one almost takes
Mufius. Come on. Is that not good television? All right. Sorry. I guess there's more. You can watch the other installments on your own time. Okay, so just trying to get you to, or that's what I kind of highlight that there's um, certain levels of quote efficiency that you can get to with reductive thinking. You get a scale that's kind of hard to manage. Um, obvious problems with animal welfare, uh, there's problems with disease vulnerability. So the short story there is, did nature ever intend that many animals in that kind of space? So you shouldn't be surprised if they have to use antibodies to make up for that. Um, do you guys know about animal so like resistance to antibodies? Uh, the, the bugs are mutating because we use so many antibiotics. And there's likely that there's at some point going to be a breakout of some bacteria that we don't have any treatment for because we used up all our first line defenders. Um, and the other thing about this process, this is one of those things where some folks will say, well, that's what the free market has come up with. The reason that you can have these confined animal feeding operations is because of this wacky system of subsidies um, that we came up with that uh, makes corn really cheap. There's a reason, like if you look at uh, different kind of sweeteners, what's most stuff's not sweetened with sugar is sweetened with what? Corn syrup, right? And that's because that's, that's not a natural thing, that's a political thing that we decided to, uh, the way uh, the farm subsidies work, uh, encourages more corn production than we need. So, that's why you've got meat um, being produced in that kind of way. Okay. So that kind of reductive reasoning has costs. All right, let's go to polyphase. Okay, um, I have a movie clip here too. Just to not overstimulate you, let's hold that for a second. Um, what, are some, what are the principles of polyphase's um, the three tenets. Anybody? Diversity, movement, and multiple use. I think that's right. That sound right? Diversity, movement, multiple use. Now, that's a little different than um, Diwani, but is it, do you see some relationship there, right? Uh, so, He's not just thinking about different stuff being in one place. We can move stuff around in different kinds of uses and some diversity is there. Okay, so he has these synergistic strategies of animal husbandry. Uh, Piggerator, Rankin House, and Eggmobiles. So let's, um, I have some pictures of, let me jump ahead here. So this is a picture of the house in Virginia, laundry in Virginia, sky shot, solitan, daughter, son, cow. Eggmobile! What's going on with the eggmobiles? Can somebody explain that? An egg with wheels? What's, what's the deal?
So instead of raising chickens for egg production and just combined animal feeding operation, they are the kind of poultry that you put out on the field, they call it pasture raised poultry, right? And they are following behind what? Cows. Yes, the picture the cows. So you have the cows. What do the cows do after they eat? End of July. There's some pooping involved. So cows poop. Um, what do, uh, but the poop gets mixed in with little um, bugs and whatnot. What do the chickens do? Chickens come along and they peck out the little larvae and stuff that are in the poop, right? Cows like that because there's what? Less flies, exactly. Um, and why is it good for the chickens? At least, I mean, they're out feeding off grass and whatever. Do they have to pay to buy food for the chickens? No, so they're, they're living off the land, right? Why do they keep them in these cages? Some of them have criminal records, right? No, what is, so, they, so you can move them, right? So you have, you take a whole pasture and divide it into paddocks. There's your word for the day. Use that with your mother. You have a paddock, and then the chickens are here, or the cows are here, and the cows move on, you move the chickens in, and you just keep, right? Does that make sense? So over time, what happens to the grass if you manage it that way? Does it get to grow? Yeah, the animals don't overgraze, right? So at any given time, most of your pasture land is, is out of offline, whatever you want to call it. Um, what, do you, what do you think the bucket is? It's uh, mostly it's water, but these chickens, these are the, the ones in rehab. It's all margarita mix. Uh, no alcohol, just the mix. Uh, yeah, I think that's the water. All right, so they work in here, do their chicken thing. Um, and then I, this is where I'm not sure, this is just in, pictures I'm pulling off the internet, right? But I think these are hens that lay eggs. And I think these are chickens that they're gonna eventually eat. I might have those backwards. But either way, where are they moving the chickens? They're taking the chickens to the food, right? As opposed to bringing food to the chickens. So there's that. And then I also found this. You guys heard of the internet? There is, you cannot believe all this stuff. Um, so they sell them a book on all their designs. So this looks like a mobile chicken coop, or at least an outdoor uh, free range kind of chicken coop. And the internet tells me they do this kind of thing for rabbits. You know what's going on right here? This guy, the people, these guys are inspiring. But this other guy's gonna break it up, so he's be fine. Don't worry. Isn't he cute? <laughs> Pasture raised turkeys. Look, you can do with anything. Pasture raised doctions. I mean, think of the possibilities. Um, Raken house. What happens in the Raken house? What's the innovative insight? Instead of having two hundred of the same animal that could cross pathogen thresholds, you have what? We have rabbits and chickens, right? So where are the rats? You gotta look hard. You see the little ears right there? You guys wouldn't cut it. Just cut it. So that's a rabbit. So the rabbit is eaten, and some of the food falls through, right? So the chickens are down here. They'll eat that food, whatnot. When do they use the saran? Winter or summer? We use this in the summer, this is all air conditioned. Either about 70, 72. No, this is for the winter, right? When they're off pasture. Close up. 
chickens. See more rabbits here. You see the rabbits kind of hiding? Ears? Then I don't want to frighten you, but this is what a chicken looks like close up. Ah! What's it going to look like? It's like, are you looking at me? You're not looking at me. Okay, and then my favorite, Tigger Raiders. So you bring the cows in during the winter and you have them in a barn, right? You're feeding them hay. Once in a while they get a smoothie, but mostly hay. And then uh, come springtime, what's the problem? You got a lot of people. So what are you gonna do? What's the strategy? So it's, a, it's beautiful, right? You just you drop, drop in a few bits of corn, mix it in, and you're like, hey, pigs, you like corn? Like, what is corn? And then you mix in some wood chips. What are the wood chips for? I'm not a biochemist, but there's something about like for the nitrogen to bind, it needs the it needs the wood chips. So the wood chips provide like a matrix that makes the backbone from which you can make the fertilizer. So anyway, but how is soliton making use of the pig's natural abilities? What do pigs like to do? Like if you're wallowing in misery or whatever, you're not happy. If a pig's wallowing in something, they're like, check out this spill. Um, so they, by their nature, they like to like burrow into stuff, right? And so he's taking that naturally evolved instinct and using it to his advantage. Uh, but pigs like to, to burrow. Look at him, they look really cute. They're like, so, so we got mud on her face. What's the problem? Okay, but in each of these systems, what's he doing? He's taken, like one of the key things is he's taken something that other people would consider waste to figure out how to make use of it. And he's, how much food does he have to go and buy at the store for his animals? It's all produced in house, so to speak. Okay. Let's answer a few more questions and then we'll run a little video. Okay, and just quick, you you see the connections to mimicking nature, right? So like cattle, how are they, if you move the cattle around, how's that mimicking nature? Cattle are used to, like they move, like bison herds or whatever, they just move around, right? They just do that, looking for fresh grass. Um, all of them, um, you're doing the basic kind of soil maintenance where what you get is you get different kinds of parts or pieces or output of animals that decay and build up soil, right? And you're avoiding these pathogens because you don't have a kind of, nothing is to a huge scale, right? So he's got a lot of different moving parts, but there's a lot of synergy and mixed use and nothing is so big as to cause um, problems. Okay, how is it how's it similar to cathodes? Are animals confined? There's confinement of animals, right? Now, I think most animal rights people would say it seems like if you got to be incarcerated, like this is a much better, right? Um, maybe the the chickens have to be in this little area, but they're outside and eating real food and all that kind of stuff. Um, and what's the, the huge what the huge difference is in terms of scale? What do I mean by that? How many cows, chickens, whatever does Solitan have? At most, I'm thinking 200 or something, 
right? It's not like a thousand, you know, a thousand hog hog corn kind of thing. So there's some similarities, but it's done in a way that's more environmentally sustainable. The other huge difference, does he have a, a, a waste problem? His waste problem becomes an input for something else. Well, there's, all, there's also some exception to the fact that um, you can find that on the polyface line is a tool to fit into an overall process. It's really just there to make sure it ends up going one way. Whereas for the cathodes, the point of confinement is to reduce production down to the least skilled labor they can possibly be so they can underpay the people who do it. Yeah, that, that's a good point. There's a whole other element of this. If you think about it from a labor perspective, what kind of, and this comes, I have this in some of the questions, I think, but what kind of skill is required to do this kind of farming? So I, I, I come from a commercial farm background. So like in general, farmers are, I think, pretty uh, swift people, but like I'm talking about like a factory farm, if you have to take, you know, manage all these cows, there's some of that, it's just labor where you're just paying somebody to go slop hogs or whatever. But, um, Solitan has more a model of you're going to raise higher quality stuff with higher wages, so to speak, to the family and whatever. The downside is how much does chicken sell for? It's more expensive, but how much protein do Americans get relative to what they eat? I forget the exact number, but we eat like three or four times more protein typically than we need. We eat a lot of meat. A lot more than we would need nutritionally. So, in other words, if you're not maybe eating as much chicken, but it's higher quality and better for you. Um, this always struck me as funny. This is one of those phrases that I think most people, or more people than I realize, don't know what that means. What's it mean in baseball that, that the home team bats last? Anybody baseball fan? Too slow. You have two innings, right? And there's one inning where you're in the field and there's one inning where you're back. If you bat last, in the last inning, you've got the last chance to score, right? So if you bat last, it's like, okay, they're up by five, we bat last. So what is Solitan saying when nature always bats last? Well, it's Who has the last say on whether you have a good idea that's going to work? Nature, that makes sense, right? So it's kind of like I think about like with the coronavirus, you can go along and say, I'm tired of I'm not gonna do this. Coronavirus. I mean, you can get angry at a virus, but it's just, you know, like what are you gonna do? Um, so in other words, in terms of sustainability and all that kind of stuff, you might have something a design that's really efficient, but if you have so much waste, you don't know what to do with it, where you have all the same kind of species. So what happens if you're a hog farmer and that one strain of hog that you have happens to be susceptible to a new virus? Right? So it, lots of times capitalism drives us into these systems where it's really efficient, but it ain't very um, robust. Whereas with solitin, like if if he lost all his rabbits or all his X or whatever, could he still survive? He's because he's pretty diversified, right? Okay, and he also talks about um compares his work to creative artist painting a landscape. What's that suggest about the nature of his work? Is it just following a manual? He's he's trying to figure stuff out, right? He's experimenting, he has this. If you look. One thing you'll notice if you Google his stuff, there's a bunch of different designs for these different things that he's tried. And you get the sense that some work better than others. Yep, yep. Yeah, so he's definitely, there's a sense of, I like about it is it's not just, um, sense that he's figuring it out, sense that he's having to try things. Okay, so, I'm going to skip these. I think just right. The cathodes produce all kinds of pollution problems. There's evidence Chesapeake Bay is being 
heavily damaged by all the chicken farms. Limitation of the polyface model is it's expensive. So you have to cultivate buyers from restaurants that are going to appreciate the higher quality product. So there might be some problems in terms of scaling this up for a full full fledged agricultural solution. Let me try this. Sometimes it makes things crash and I just click on it. Or it does this where you can't see anything. Oh, sorry, I don't mean to scare you with socialism. Okay. Maybe horrible. Open board. <laughs> This place is what needs to be the new normal. This farm was the armpit of the community. It was the most abused, worn out, gully, rock pile. The pastures were very, very thin, and there were huge, washed out gullies in the back of called the badlands. And the rest were blurred. This is just amazing. It's like a jungle. It's such a breathtaking scene. This is being raised about five times this year. How do we use the natural proclivity of animals to do work instead of machinery and children? The principle here is strategic disturbance is the key to environmental innovation. This farm so different. I think it's all of the symbolic relationships in human nature. Not cows eating grass, not chickens that follow them, scratch through their manure and bugs, and not turkeys following them eating bugs. You've got the forest, you've got pigs, you come down, you've got people buying their food directly off the farm, and you've got all these young people who are learning off the masters. Farm is around. Began to see and realize that we were doing things a little differently than they were. They were all thought we were kind of crazy enough to not allow any plant to increase more than I think we did. It's immediately clear that this is different for the farmers. There are the sheer quantity of land on this place. Somebody's like holding your eyes and say,
one or two Super Bowl studios uh, right now. They're just, you know, killing bad guys and slaying dragons and things like that. But, you know, just like I thought that desire from my parents, I hope that at least one of them catch that desire from me. Okay, I think I subjected you to two Republican ads and no Democratic ads. So I'm sorry for the lack of balance. You did, however, though, if you're watching carefully, you got to see a cow poop, which I hope made your day. All right, we will leave it there. Thank you all. Thank you.